Well, guys, the day has finally come. Today, we are privileged to be sitting down with two men who are making huge waves throughout the alien and UFO research community. The first is investigative journalist, activist, and filmmaker Jeremy Corbell, the man behind the upcoming documentary we're talking about today. And the other is a man that most of you have only heard whispers about over the past 30 or so years. A man that, among other things, brought the very existence of Area 51 to light and is said to have actually worked on recovered alien craft at the secretive military base, Mr. Bob Lazar. Gentlemen, it's an honor to have you both here. Thank you for coming on today, and uh, we uh, really appreciate it. Millions of people appreciate this. Thanks so much. Thanks, Tyler. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. Well, um... As well, I'm sure you know, Jeremy, uh, many of the audience members, my audience members, have commented that uh, they didn't think this day would ever come. Uh, Bob, you have become sort of a UFO legend and icon over the years, and especially to the younger generations of people curious about the UFO topic. Because the world wanted it, and now it's here finally, we have this definitive documentary on your life. So the first thing I want to ask you both is, was this a smooth process creating this film? Boy, that's a tough question. <laughs> that is, that, it's kind of, it was a, a long, arduous process. And um, uh, clearly much more difficult for Jeremy than for me. Yeah, I don't know uh, if that's true. I mean, Bob, you know, lived, uh, you know, this, you know, experience for 30 years. So I don't know who's more difficult for, but I think that the joke in in it all is, no, it's not been a totally smooth road. Um, Bob has, you know, he didn't ask me to make a movie. I begged him to make a movie, Um, but I'm really glad that he allowed me to do it because I think where we ended up is somewhere really powerful where the people that have never heard his story will now get to hear it and um, they'll hear it in its true form. They won't hear the lies and they won't hear the... Uh, propaganda and the things that aren't true, they're going to hear it straight. And of course, they'll hear a portion of it. But a man's life for 30 years is much bigger than an hour and a half movie. Right. Well, I mean, that my motivation was simply getting out an accurate account of what's going on, because there is so much nonsense that's been repeated on the Internet and distorted. And um, so really, I was just looking for a, a vehicle to get the true story out yeah right right and I, I think for 30 years now that has been what people have been waiting for now if i could ask you jeremy could you tell us a little about what originally what it was that got you interested to speak with bob about his experiences and get this sort of thing you know get the ball rolling so to say yeah i mean real simple i think like most of your listeners uh if they were born in 1989 already uh, i was 13 years old and I heard Bob on the radio uh, and George Knapp interviewing him, and it really, I like to say it weaponized my my curiosity in that uh, when I heard what he said about the uh, gravity propulsion system, it kind of flipped the script for me because I was aware of rockets and that kind of thing, but the idea of falling into place in space and time, I mean, it was just really cool. And the technology of it and the propulsion system, that got me curious, and from that day forward, I was listening. Exactly. And and um, as you said earlier, there's been a ton of uh, disinformation. I mean, a, a lot of the videos that I've made surrounding Bob have just been the same old info that's out there. I mean, there hasn't been really anything new in all of these years. And so I really don't know if a lot of the stuff that I referenced regarding his experiences was true Uh, half true and so I wanted to ask some questions here that I know my audience would would love to hear to you Bob now you have said that you worked at S4 on did you say there were at least nine craft that you knew of alien craft at this secretive site yeah there were absolutely nine yeah okay now uh, apart from the sleeker sports model craft that you had mentioned in the past can you give us an idea uh, perhaps of what the condition of the other craft were in were they totaled were they shot down in a perfect condition as if they'd been gifted to the military what what type of condition were they in if you could say the condition 
uh, of all the craft, with the exception of one, which it looked like uh, they had intentionally fired a projectile at, uh, just to see if the projectile would penetrate it. But with the exception of that craft, everything looked like it was new. Now, I've heard stories and, you know, read on the internet about, you know, theories about them being gifted or crash landing. Clearly, none of them crashed at all. Now, my gut feeling, and this is my gut feeling, I have no information on this, that I almost believe that this, this was some sort of archaeological find in some way. Really? So I don't, I don't think, I don't think there was a, I don't think there was a, a an exchange like we're gonna give you a bunch of craft or, um, I just, it, and again, I, I really can't say why. It's just because of the mutterings of my supervisor and the other people that worked there. And it was very compartmentalized, as I understand it. I mean, it was all, it was basically, here's what you need to know, and you don't need to know anything else. Is that basically how it was? Yeah, we worked on the buddy system, and you know when I worked on nuclear weapons at Los Alamos, it's 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 similar. You know, you don't get to know the entire project, how everything works. You're you're assigned a component of it, and right. you work on that component. And you, unlike Los Alamos and other places, there is no free open discussion. And open discussion is really what propels science forward. Uh, that's the one problem I really had down at S4. You know, they worked on the buddy system. Uh, my lab buddy, quote unquote, was uh, Barry. And you're only given really one person to bounce ideas off of. And you can talk to him. In fact, when you go have lunch at the facility, you can only sit with him and you can only talk with him. You can't talk with other people or exchange ideas. And that in itself can thwart uh, you know, the entire project moving forward. But um, right. it's, it, yeah, it's very compartmentalized. So it was really just Barry and I working on that one small subcomponent at that time. Right. And I think I'm, I'm really glad you said that because that's a message I've been trying to communicate to especially the younger viewers out there who in this sort of high paced Internet age, they want everything now. They want all of the answers right now. And so they come to me. And they hear that I may be speaking with you and Jeremy, and they say, well, look, if you're talking to the most well-known name in ufology, if you're talking to Bob, well, he should know all the answers. You should be able to get every answer about aliens, where they come from. You should be able to lay it out for me in a nice summary, and I try to let them know this is not how things work. Bob was a part, he was one of many. Everything was very compartmentalized. And so you do have answers, but you don't have the full scope because you were just a link in the chain as it happens working there. But your story is fascinating in and of itself. And I'd like to pivot to Jeremy here and ask you sort of a double question, Jeremy, if I could. First of all, with this film and with others, is it true that you do everything yourself as far as filming, interviewing, recording, audio editing? Are you truly an independent filmmaker? And at the same time, being an independent and doing a film like this, very controversial film, uh, have you ran into anything during the making of this, uh, any sort of pushback, uh, uh, things happening, or from people or places that didn't want this film to come out? You know, um, Tyler, well, first of all, look, man, yeah, I'm a completely independent filmmaker. People don't understand what that means. I also film in the tour fashion, which basically means I, I do everything. I edit I film, I, I finance it. So yeah, I'm totally independent. Uh, my life, you know, doing this is dependent upon people liking it. So if you watch my films, it directly affects me. So yes, I'm an independent, completely independent filmmaker. The second part of your question is, have I been resisted in any way in doing uh, this film? I was going to just say no. I'm just like laughing now. Um, so the answer to that is, I had never been in any way um, resisted, only assisted. People have only helped me in the process of making films. They encourage me. They give me tips. So actually, personally, yeah, no, I, I, personally, I have never, ever experienced anything that would try to stop me from making a film. I'll just leave it at that. Right. 
Well, uh, certainly we do know that Bob, uh, again, from what we know that is public or that he has said himself, he has had a, a great amount of pushback over the years from, from coming out and, and what he's done. And, you know, I think one of the biggest questions on my viewers' minds, as well as mine, to Bob here is, if I may ask bluntly, if you did what you did, and it, it, it looks like you got someone scared. I mean, I believe that you are telling the truth 100%. So let's just say if you did it, how are you still alive? Well, clearly, that was the whole point of coming out and saying what I did. Look, you just can't kill people as soon as they say something. All it does is underline what they said and immediately get everybody looking in that direction. You know, the, the fact that I said um, what I did and told of my experiences down at S4, that was done to protect myself. I had already been shot at before that. And, um, you know, so it, it works in the opposite of, of what most people think. Right, right. To, to, to take us down would, would only be to further validate our claims, basically. Exactly, exactly. I'll tell you a little thing real quick, just... You know, people don't know the humanity of this, the actual experience. So, you know, no matter what you think or what you can make up in your mind, Bob came forward to protect himself. That's what happened. Right. And he didn't come forward, you know, oh, you know, openly like, oh, yeah, let's do this, man. I mean, George Knapp and Bob Lazar physically wrestled on the ground the day that the tape was being put in to reveal his identity. George told me the story. I recorded it. And, and, and Bob told me the story. So you have to understand, look at it that way. I mean, it's hilarious. I mean, obviously, George won. You know, he's... Right, won. right. He wipes my way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like he beat him, but it's like, you know, that was the deal, man. It, whether you understand it or believe it or not, um, I've come to truly understand that Bob came forward to protect himself. Well, it, it's kind of more complicated than that. You know, this mm. doesn't, I know everybody's used to watching Hollywood films and things of that sort, you know, and it's not how real life goes. You don't shoot, you know, bullets into a gas tank and they explode into giant fireballs. That stuff doesn't happen. <laughs> right. you know? And it doesn't work like that either. They don't, the only time they would go out of their way to kill someone is if they're consistently releasing increasingly damaging information the thing is i released all the damaging information initially and i was done there was nothing else to say there was no reason to stop me any further right what they do at that point they did do they began to destroy your friends and family people i know have you know we audited by the irs people that had security clearances and other jobs of that sort had their clearances pulled, so they begin to destroy the world around you, so you lose your support group. It's a lot more complicated than people think or Hollywood portrays. Was it true that you were shot at at one point in time? Yes, yes, I was shot at uh, on the on Charleston Boulevard, getting on to the the freeway in in Las Vegas. Yeah. In your opinion, do you think that was part of the sort of campaign to just discredit you. They, they know they can't kill you, but they know that they, they can spend years trying to discredit you, hurting you and your family. Now, those pop shots that they took at you, do you think that was a part of that? Maybe just to scare you? Was it just a lone wolf? Do you think it had anything to do with it? Or was it just one of those freak things where you were like, well, what the hell was that? But you got away and that was it. You never, you never found out what that was from. I don't know. I, I think it was just essentially terrorism um you know i think like i think we mentioned in the movie there were times uh my friend and i would go out uh to work at a, a health club there and you know all the car doors and you know drunken hood would be open i mean there were constant things that that let me know that you know they could gain access or do whatever they wanted to right and uh they were on you right yeah, quite frankly, it really was wearing me down at the time. I uh, I really wasn't sure what I was going to do. George tells uh, a lot of this story. He says, you know, he always told me for all these years, I mean, you know, George has been a mentor to me in journalism. He's uh, broke the story with Bob in 1989. Uh, he has said to me over and over when I first started talking to him, he goes, you're never going to get it because you weren't there. I was there, he says. He goes, I saw it. This is real. This happened. Someone didn't want Bob talking. They wanted to mess with him, and they did mess with him. So I guess the point is, 
you know, looking at it now, 30 years later, from our outside views, you know, it's different than the people that lived it. And I've talked to a lot of them now, a lot of them that lived it. Some of them went on camera with me for the movie. So I just want to kind of put an exclamation point on what Bob said. You know, right. this is real. It is real. I mean, from from the thousands of videos that I've done, and again, I just sort of take take what comes to me. I try to correlate. I post it to YouTube, and I do stories on people like you and Bob. And from what I'm found, you know, it, it's extremely real. They're definitely covering it up. It's an ongoing cover up. Um, you know, and my question for for Bob would be. You know, what? what is your opinion, Bob, on the state of, I guess you'd call it, the UFO movement where we have guys like me on YouTube, but we have many others putting out movies and books. A lot of them, in my opinion, charlatans. That's why I don't do interviews with them, but they do have huge followings, a lot of disinformation. So, you know, was it that that kind of caused you to come back into the spotlight and if not, what was it that, that made you say, okay, it's been long enough. I'm going to come back out and tell the truth of exactly what happened and do this film. What was your major, your, uh, <clears throat> you know, your, your step stone to doing that? Well, if you're talking about the step stone to doing the movie with Jeremy, um, well, I mean, that certainly played a part. There was so much nonsense getting passed around and it began to grow and fester as time went on because I never challenged any of it and people get, began to build on it and it, it got to ridiculous proportions and uh, I mean that was really shocking and and you know as you mentioned anytime I looked on the internet or read any UFO material it was so blatantly nonsense and whether it's Facebook or Twitter or I mean I don't I'm not really into any social media but there you can find people that were I mean, pretending to be me mm -hmm. I mean, on, on, on everything. I even was listening one time on an AM radio driving, I think it was to New Mexico from uh, Las Vegas. And it was late night. I turned the radio on just to, you know, keep myself awake. And it was a, a UFO program. So I turned it on on talk radio. And here's a guy that, that was talking about, yeah, I had lunch with Bob Lazar yesterday. And look, he told me all this new info. It was all nonsense. <laughs> so, I mean, all of this was just constantly going on. And I heard so much nonsense. Uh, I mean, from people having interviews with reptil reptilians on YouTube. And it's crazy. So the, the sad thing is that, yeah, there's probably two or three percent true and accurate information out there but how especially today the way information is disseminated around on the internet how are you going to dig through 98 percent nonsense and mine out the two percent it's almost impossible it's, it is almost impossible i mean in, in a small way that's what i attempt to do uh, with secure team i i get i have multiple people working for me they bring me you know research summaries every day i try to sift through it it's hard to do anything from a computer screen i mean some things you just need to get out there and do but as you said it's probably three percent of it is real and, you know, it reminds me of a time where, again, someone had come on to my channel, posted a comment. They had your face as their little, uh, you know, screen name face there and said, hey, guys, Bob Lazar here. You know, ask me anything you want. You know, right in the comments <laughs> of one of my videos. And I said, there's no way. But it was amazing to see how many people were brought in by that, totally fooled by it. I think I ended up deleting uh, the comment after I finally figured it out. I, I highly doubt Bob would just pop up in the comment section after all these years and you know i, I just so you're right the, i mean it's the just... only you know for a brief period bob was trying to answer questions on twitter and that just was overwhelming and that was done with uh however i'm going to take personal credit both for uh our buddy zach's engagement and also for <laughs> and also for the fact that uh united nuclear which is bob's business is now officially on Instagram, and his lead employee um, Zach is the one that uploads the images. And I just he just started it a few days ago. I don't know if Bob even knows that. I think he does, but Zach's doing the official United Nuclear um, Instagram. So so there is now finally an official social media where people can. But it's your, not from me. No, it's yeah. your business. It's right, your yeah. business. That's awesome. Congratulations. That's awesome. That's awesome news, and. You know, I think it's awesome, and you're going to see this in the film. I don't want to give too much away, but yeah. uh, this is the first time in many years that we get a, a, 
a bird's eye view into the life of Mr. Lazar, uh, what he went through, very tough times, how the controversy shaped him throughout the years and to my viewers who are listening you're going to see that in this film you're going to see a lot of stuff and again i don't want to talk about it uh jeremy uh, without saying too much is, is there maybe something that happened in this film of note that maybe you'd like to kind of talk about something explosive or that sort of what blew your mind about making this film or what has bob told you rather <laughs> well i mean yeah the, the, look the, the whole process for me w was kind of mind-blowing. You know, George challenged me in 2012. Oh, yeah, sure. Get Bob to talk to you. You have to be the luckiest leprechaun in the world. I mean, it was like, <laughs> it was hilarious. So the whole process, I think, has been, for me, really interesting. You know, Bob saying, okay, total open book. What do you want to know? Let's do it. You know, here are the tapes. Here's the photographs. I'm not going to pre-sort them. Just grab the box of tapes and digitize them. Whatever's on there. It's yours. So Bob has been completely 100% open with me without giving me any restriction, put me in touch with his mom, his friend, whatever. So that's been really eye-opening, to be honest with you. Right. Um, so I don't know, man. I, I think what – I'll give you one thing from the movie. I'll, I'll give you a spoiler right now. Okay. So close your ears. The fans you want, want it. Okay, the fans want it. Uh, okay, so I'll give you a hardcore one, man. So uh, 30 years ago, Bob Lazar said – that uh, there was a gentleman named Mike Thigpen, a very specific name, that this guy was, he thought, an agency that was doing a background check on him. He didn't know, maybe FBI. George goes on the news. He says, oh, we've got some news. There's a guy named Mike Thigpen. And he came and like questioned uh, Bob Lazar. You know, we can check the veracity of his claims. And you he know, went on the news. And I, I can just imagine, I talked, you know, I could just imagine this guy, he's, he's eating like pasta at his house. And he's at dinner with his wife. He sees the news and like just it's a fork drop moment. He just draws his fork into his food. <laughs> well, I know that, you know, that was his reaction because after 30 years, I found him. I found yeah. Mike Thigpen. And that could only be done after 30 years because George tried in 1989, called and the FBI. He had a source that told him it wasn't the FBI, George. It was the OFI, Office of Federal Investigation. They were doing Bob's security clearance. So George tried to get a hold of this guy who was, by the way, in trouble because they wondered if he was impersonating an FBI agent because how did that get confused? Mm -hmm. So this poor guy, you know, he's just doing his job and he got hit with a storm because of this. Well, for 30 years, no one was able to find him. I found him, tracked him down, and I talked to him. And he is a cool cat. He's a good guy. And he says, yes, I was doing security clearances in 1989 for Nellis and the, the base. And I do. He says, I'll go as far as I do remember Bob Lazar. <laughs> well, Jeremy, let me follow that up and ask, you know, has your personal opinion about the world in general, the world we live in, has it changed at all since you've gotten to know Bob Lazar? Has it enlightened you about certain things or may, maybe changed your mind regarding certain things or topics? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think what my hope for the movie is that you get to kind of know Bob a little bit because I think that's the missing component. A lot of people can dehumanize Bob and his story and just, you know, say whatever they want about him because they don't know him. And so it's easy to make stuff up that wouldn't be congruent with his character because there's nothing to defend it. So I hope in my movie you kind of get a feel as a documentary filmmaker. I hope you get a feel for who Bob is because I believe a big part of the story is – the human story. It's about who Bob is. Is he somebody that would be trying to like waste his time messing with you for 30 years or is he somebody who, who wouldn't? And I think that's a, you know, that's the big question. Everybody in the earth wants to know, is Bob worthy of our trust? When you boil it down, that's what it is. They want to know, is Bob worthy of our trust? Of course, of course, everybody wants to to believe this. What a cool story. We all want to believe it. But that's the only way that they're going to get, you know, to the bottom line is if they kind of look at the facts, determine Do for themselves. Do the facts, back it up. That's what they truly yeah, want to know. Don't, don't use junk data. That's right. Bob's. Don't use junk data. Don't use the, the stories that aren't true. So, yes, my whole life has been changed because, you know, I wanted to know if this story was true. I wanted to know if you the truth about UFOs. 
hey, that's a bonus. Really, I got to know a guy named Bob Lazar, and he's a cool fucking guy. So, oh, I can't say that on your YouTube. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no, it's, it's fine. It's Sweep totally that out. He's a, cool, he's a cool dude. Yeah, so there you go. This is historic. Say whatever you want. Do whatever you want. Get naked okay. if you like. So, <laughs> Sweep me out. Yeah, <laughs> so, Bob, I want to get back, if I could. I know you've probably talked about this a million times, but, you know, of course, I know the viewers would love to know a little bit more about some of these craft that you worked on at S4. So, just a few basic questions, whether you know all the answers or not, at least we can say, this is what Bob knows, exactly. So, I guess I'd like to start off with, now we covered the sports model, the conditions they were in. Now, were you ever told at any time um, uh, what star system or area of space that the craft came from? Uh, did they uh, come home from all the same place, if you know what I mean? When were they acquired? Do you have any of that information about these craft? I don't have any information as far as when, and it wasn't, you know, I like to get very particular on, on exactly what was told or read or I saw. So uh, I was not told that, but I did read in the briefings that the cra all of the craft, the craft came from the Zeta Reticuli star system. So that's the location. It's a, it's a binary star system. Uh, apparently there are several planets around it and it's only visible from the southern hemisphere right. so don't bother going out there and trying to find it at night right. Um, right. but yeah again that's something that I read and uh, that's that's all that I know about that yeah well, oddly enough that specific hmm. star system is uh, well known in the ufology movement um, for you know whether it's true or false there have been a lot of stories a lot of reports a lot of testimony just a lot of stories that seem to all go back one way or another to that star system so there definitely may something you know something might be there so that's very very interesting now if we could speaking a little bit more about the equipment in some of these craft can you explain uh, the equipment that was on board the sport model craft uh, as far as communications, weaponry, or camouflage? You know, what did you see when walking into this craft? Um, those are all separate questions. <laughs> so, um, I, again, to be specific, uh, as far as how, you know, a very uh, brief overview of how, how the craft worked, um, there is a reactor in the center of the craft. In this craft, there are only three seats. Um, at the bottom of the craft, there are several levels in there. At the bottom, the sublevel of the craft, there are three gravity emitters. They look like, for lack of a better analogy, like a couple 55-gallon drums stuck on top of one another. Just big tubes. Um, there were three of them. And they're on a very interesting, uh, connected to the floor above, on a very interesting pipe, I guess you would call it, that bends at 360 degrees. So these are just three big drums essentially suspended. Directly above them are the gravity amplifiers. Uh, they sit right above them and the uh, uh, reactors in the middle. The reactor produces the energy and produces the base gravity wave. It's amplified by the amplifiers. And it's channeled down into the gravity emitters. And the gravity emitters can be swung in any direction uh, to produce a distortion in gravity. Uh, there is no wiring. There is no interconnection between any components. The components work just by being close to one another. And considering the power output, which is the equivalent of a few nuclear power plants, that's really amazing because... You know, according to the laws of thermodynamics, there always has to be a loss. Right. There, you know, there's no 100% transfer of energy. But it apparently was occurring here because there was no excess heat produced anywhere. And I, I can run off on a technical tangent here, but I won't. Um, you also asked what I saw inside, I think. Yeah, uh, uh, communication systems or, or maybe what was the, uh, the type of metal used, if it was metal at all. Uh, you know, things of that nature. Again, this is uh, compartmentalized. So okay. there was a, um, a metallurgy group that dealt with that. All I can say is I, I felt and ran my hand against uh, the material. All the entire craft is the same color and it's all the same material. And there are no sharp corners anywhere. There is a radius on everything. And it felt 
to me, when I put my hand on it, it felt cold. In my mind, that relates to metal. But could it be an advanced ceramic of some kind? You know, absolutely. So I, I can't, can't even comment on what the, uh, what the craft is made of. It was kind of a pewter gray in color. Right. Uh, and there was an upper level on, on the craft that I did not have access to or information on. Uh, it's where, if you've seen pictures of the craft that I worked on, there are black rectangular what people call portholes around the top. They're not, they're not windows. I personally believe there's some sort of planar sensor mm -hmm. uh, that just determines where the craft is in space and ha how to orient itself. Right. So, well, I, I think that uh, having said all that, I think what would probably be an even more important question to my viewers, which is that, do these things have bathrooms? <laughs> let me, let me, there's actually a really cool answer for that. Let That's me, a popular question. It is. Yeah. It is. But let, let me ask Bob something real quick because I actually don't know the answer and I want to know. It's like, uh, was there an obvious navigation? Like, how do you think they flew the craft? Was there like a some kind of navigational? I, I, I really don't know. Yeah. I, really, I, I have no idea how they got from, I mean, I see like how the. hand thing or, you know. I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I don't even like to speculate because then people will say, well, Bob said, right, right, so right, that's right. not, uh, so I don't even want to go. Okay, there. so do they have bathrooms? Did you see? No, your... no, there's no <laughs> bathrooms, and quite frankly, there's no need for them because the travel time is so short. You know, you're taking gigantic, remember, time, you know, space time is one thing, and if you're distorting space time, you're taking gigantic leaps in milliseconds that, right. you know, you're not traveling you well, don't really break the speed of light because you're traveling in a linear fashion, but you go far in excess of the speed of light because you're bending space and time. Right. You know, you're just taking gigantic leaps. So there's, you're never assuming they need bathrooms. Yeah, right. Um, you know, um, well, especially you're not in flight in a, uh, for a long enough time, you know, to have any kind of emergency. Right, right. And, and another thought I had had, which has been widely discussed, is that many of these alien beings, or at least... Uh, particularly the smaller gray alien, a lot of people seem to believe that these are uh, droids of some sort. They are not flesh and blood, and they are more like probes that are sent out. They fly these things, so there is no need for eating or drinking or using the bathroom or anything like that. Have you heard anything similar, or have you, have you at least heard of this theory, and that's to you or Jeremy? Uh, I haven't heard of that theory, me, but I do have to say... I did see a briefing. Now, you know, there are several other projects going on at the same time. And what we do have is each group gets a, a two or three page briefing of what the other groups are doing. And they're trying, again, they're trying to keep everything compartmentalized. But what they want to do is at least let you have a little knowledge of what's going on in the other groups in case there is a connection. So you, you know, can complete your, you know, your research. Right. But so right. in my briefing, it did have to do with, um, as far as the, you know, the actual beings uh, that were in the craft, they had a photograph of them where their, uh, a chest was cut and, and peeled back and they had made notes of, wow. it's a, there, it was only one central organ, it's as if all the organs had grown together into one mass and it had multiple functions. And... That was like the extent of my knowledge of it. Right. But right. it was certainly a biological specimen. Now, whether or not that piloted the craft or that was making reference to uh, something, you know, that had to do with the craft, uh, I don't know. But there was there was definitely a reference to a biological entity of some kind right. that had unique organs inside. Well, and another thing regarding these craft, uh, this may be the most controversial of this whole Bob Lazar topic is that of Element 115, which is said to have been used to power these craft. And, of course, nobody knew back in the 80s. Element 115 did not exist. It wasn't until almost 20 years later that, yes, we have something here. Now, there are uh, debunkers, so-called debunkers out there who say, well... Bob didn't know what he was talking about in regards to Element 115. It's not stable. So what would you say to them regarding Element 115, how it exactly worked, and maybe how maybe these debunkers today simply just don't understand 
these things about this element you know they're, they're not in the know as much as you were what can you tell us about that element and why it was perfectly legit and it was used to power these craft yeah, well, that's an understatement. First of all, don't tell me I don't know about 115 because it was in my hand. Second of all, 115 was synthesized recently. And, you know, for people saying, well, it's not stable and, you know, that's the end of it. Uh, clearly, you don't understand chemistry, the, you know, the, uh, the way elements work. Right. All right. elements have isotopes to them. And the example I always give is, you know, for example, hydrogen. We all know hydrogen is a, a gas, hydrogen one. Actually, the technical name is protium to it. Um, it has one proton and one neutron. Well, there's actually two other forms of hydrogen. One is deuterium and one is tritium. Tritium is radioactive. Well, there's, you know, other elements, cesium, that can have 20 or 30, I don't remember what it is, uh, isotopes to it. All elements can have the same number of protons making the element, but they can have different numbers of neutrons. And by changing the different n number of neutrons, the element can have remarkably different properties. So yeah, element 115 probably has many, many isotopes of it that decay, but there is certainly one isotope that is absolutely stable, and it is that isotope that is used in the craft right so, so it's basically sort of a, a, a an issue where you know just just because we can't figure it out yet today does not mean that these alien beings didn't have it figured out because they did obviously well no, no question in time if they keep experimenting what now keep in mind they only made four atoms of 115 and again if they keep experimenting with it i'm sure they'll find uh, eventually a combination with neutrons that will be stable and that'll be another point of indication but um, yeah that's typical of any element there's nothing new about that and anybody claiming you know that that disproves it uh, really has limited knowledge about that yeah I'm gonna jump in here and just say I've done a lot of research for the film on this because I wanted to understand it you know I'm not a scientist I'm a filmmaker but I did talk with some of the top scientists in the nation and outside of our nation from Russia to San Francisco to um, gosh uh, Washington DC so I talked to a number of scientists and physicists and people that actually work hands-on with the fabrication of super heavy elements and across the board, the, the you know, some people got ticklish talking to me when they realized that it had anything to do with UFOs. However, the people that would talk to me about the hardcore science, they absolutely 100% unanimously across the board confirmed and agreed that element 115, that we cannot discount a stabilized version exactly like Bob Lazar described. So I, I just want to make that really, really clear to your audience, Tyler, because people always use this as a fake news. They use this as something to say to dismiss and discount what Bob said. And, and, and that is they say that it is junk science or it is pseudo science what he said. I have confirmed every way from Sunday that we cannot discount a stabilized form of element 115. And, and so I just I want to say that on the record now, it is total BS when people try to act like scientists and, and say that, that it's uh, they discount it. They either don't understand the story or they've got an agenda because the top of the top of the world to deal with this told right. me to my face. So I just want to throw that down. Well, you heard it right there, guys. Uh, th th that's all the info you need to know about 115, exactly what Bob and Jeremy just said. I mean, we have scientists on record who say what Jeremy just said. I mean, we, we know the element exists, and I personally believe that he was there. And, you know, as we were talking about these so-called debunkers who will pick and choose these little things, you know, a lot of people attack Bob by saying, well... Uh, there's there's no proof that he worked at Los Alamos or there's no proof he went to this 
this college or was at this base or anything like that. Well, we've come to find out that, that he is, and there, there has been proof, uh, not just finding his name in uh, the phone book registry, but uh, as many of you will see in the film, and I don't want to give anything away, but there is much more to this story that proves that Bob was there, he did this work, so you can count on that, uh, seeing it in this film. Now, you mentioned earlier, Jeremy, uh, Mr. George Knapp. Now, he is your mentor, is that correct? Yeah, George Knapp has been a mentor to me. Uh, he's been an incredible resource of information. He originally broke the story about Bob back in 1989, and he actually championed for 25 plus years completely alone, you know, about this story. And uh, I really admire him for that. He stuck to his guns. And uh, look, George Knapp was convinced of, of Bob's truth. And if for a second he thought Bob wasn't telling the truth, he would have not only drop the story, he would have exposed Bob. And people forget, look, man, Bob tried to prove his story to you. Um, you know, George wanted to know, too. So George put him through four polygraph tests. Bob aced them all. Aced them. No aced deception. Him. Yeah, aced them. No, you know, no which way from Sunday about that. So that was with Terry Tabernetti, period, full stop, aced them all. So what else can he do? You know, look, George put him in front of people that verified, worked at Area 51 at the time, because that's where Bob would land in the plane and then go on the bus and aced it. They all believed he was there. At least they could prove Area 51. So George really put Bob through his paces. It's not just like he wanted as a journalist to believe a cool story. So there's a lot of history here. People need to right, just understand. Right. And was already, so George is the bomb is what I'm saying. He's the bomb. <laughs> he is. And, and he, and he I, did the work and he stood up and he stands for it and he beat his chest like King Kong and he's the bomb. That's he it. He is. He, that definitely well said, sir. Now he also, he also took people out and he said, look, I know for a fact that they are going to be testing these craft at a certain time of night in a certain area, and isn't it true that multiple times, Bob, you took people out, and like clockwork, these craft were out there being tested, and you even got it on film. Is that correct? Yeah, I did have, when I was there, the one thing uh, that I was able to memorize were the name. First of all, there were only 22 other people that had clearance to work on the project. And I knew those names. And there was also a clear test schedule. And they always, the, you know, the, the test site is close, not close, but I mean the closest highway to it is, uh, I don't remember the distance to that. Do you, no, Jeremy? No, no. It, it's, it's not. But what they did is they looked for statistically the lowest volume of traffic along the highway before they right. did the tests and that was always on a Wednesday night all the tests all the flight tests were on a Wednesday night and I had the times of those tests down now when things went bad between us and my employers there um, you know I still had the schedule so that's when I told my friends hey we need to go out what I told you I want to show you guys what I was working on so we you know we'd go out there hide out in the desert and the craft came up and flew around, you know, at the times that I specified. Right. It's amazing footage. And, you know, it, it, I know it's been years, but from what you saw them testing in those videos, in your experience and in your opinion, from maybe some of the research you've done today, I'm not sure if you've had ever your own UFO encounter, but in your opinion, would most of the UFOs seen today uh, come from a human source, from an off-world source. There's, it is almost split right down the middle where half of my audience believe that it, it's all us. Every craft, the, even the ones that show, you know, anti-gravity uh, tech, everything is ours. Half The other half believe it's, it's all off-world and that maybe we have one or two of their craft. I mean, in your opinion, where, where do you think you would fall? Well, um, it's certainly advanced technology. Now, I mean, can I say that it's not advanced? I mean, this is really pushing the limits of, you know, belief here. But can I say it's not advanced technology from the future? I mean, that's possible. It is. How do you explain the connection to Zeta Reticuli, though? I mean, is it possible in the future humans live there and we're coming back and just checking on ourselves? I mean, all of these are... It, that is another big theory, it, that it is humans, I mean, it, it is us. It's possible. No, I have, I, have, I have nothing to say that that's possible or not possible. It, it, it's all, it, it can all possibly be real. Right. Um, but uh, I, well, 
I really don't know, actually. Well, I think, I mean, if, it's funny you ask, like, you know, has Bob ever had well, a I was going to come to you next. Have was, you seen one, no, Jeremy? I, 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 <laughs> but I was joking because, of course, like, you, you did because you had S4, but not a classic UFO. Experience. No, a, a classic U. Actually, yeah. when I went to work out there, the first thing I thought was, first of all, I never believed at UFOs. I thought people that believed in UFOs were just nutcakes. And, uh, you know, when I went out there, the first time I saw the craft, I thought, oh, well, this clearly explains all the UFO sightings were developing a really advanced fighter and they've been testing it and everybody thinks it's alien life forms. This is hilarious. I'm so, you know, happy to be working on this project. And it was clear that was not the case. Right. Yeah. What I meant to say was since then, have do you have you seen anything in the skies or do you think there's any uh, of our public technology uh, fighter jets that we have today that could be potentially using tech? from those crafts so many years ago, just in your opinion? I haven't seen anything at all. I mean, the technology is extremely advanced, and uh, I haven't seen anything. It's all been just... And you were not you, know. you were not able to successfully back-engineer it, were you? I just want to clarify that. When you were working on these craft, was there an, wasn't there an issue where, I mean, you can take them apart, you can analyze them, but you, you, you couldn't replicate it? Was that true? Right. It wasn't just back engineering. I mean, the, the aim of the project was to duplicate the technology with the materials available to us. Now, we could, at least from what we ascertained, is determine how the systems worked. But there was no... We, the problem is we couldn't duplicate anything. We couldn't even duplicate the metal in the conduits. Everything was, and pardon the pun, was alien to us. And uh, it, it was just too big of a project. And so, you know, they would have splinter groups working on smaller components of it. Like, you know, you guys figure out how this part works. But it's really a dead end. The, the material science was just too advanced for us. So, right. no, we couldn't duplicate anything. Now, maybe there were some, you know, the, there were some components here or the way things were laid out that might have translated themselves into military components but it you know to me it was just a giant military project but the you know the major technology never made it into anywhere because it's uh it was all very high energy related and we had no way to store and transmit levels of that energy do you th at, at all do you think they're still likely working on it sort of tinkering with it to this day trying to make something out of it in some dark yeah. hangar somewhere it would probably be conjecture. I mean, um, you know, I remember when I first talked to Dennis, that was my supervisor. They had an argument about this being out in the South Pacific to keep it out of. And remember, that's where they did the first, you know, uh, thermonuclear bomb right. test, um, you know, to put it out there just to keep it away from prying eyes and, and things of that sort. Uh, but uh, uh, the reason was the same as it was for the, you know, hydrogen bomb development in the 50s was it's just too expensive to shuttle back and forth all the time. Um, but that was always in the back of their minds. They always wanted to leave the continental United States and take the stuff somewhere else. Um, maybe after I came out and kind of you know, ruined the situation <laughs> there, they did that or... Uh, it's. I would find it very hard to believe that's in the same place and still proceeding at at the same rate. But uh, right. uh, there's no doubt they research continues on it. Well, and I think, and Jeremy, I think, would you agree to this that, despite the fact that we don't know where they're coming from, would you agree that we are definitely surveilling them? I mean, with the recent DoD releases of those three UFO clips taken from fighter jets, uh, everything I've been able to to scrounge up and put on the channel. I mean, they're, they're, they definitely seem to be monitoring these things. They, they know that these things are here. We know that they're here. I mean, <laughs> it doesn't take long. I mean, how many pieces of footage and eyewitness testimonials I, do you have to go through to, before you yeah, start I, believing? I, I, Right. I mean, look, it's not a matter of belief. You know, UFOs are either real or they're not real. Obviously, they're real. If you don't understand that, then you have a data poor perspective. But the, you know, kind of a social kind of consciousness, people are starting to understand that now because of the release from the New York Times in December of 2017 
However, I'd like to say I did break the Tic Tac UFO case, the famous Tic Tac right, UFO did. case, before the New York Times, because Commander David Fravor, who's a friend of mine, was talking to me for two years before that, and I kept it quiet. I didn't tell anybody, and I developed sources. I broke that story That's twice right. before the New York Times. Now, what does that tell you? Yeah, I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt. The United States government does have a UFO program, and they admitted it to you. And it was called ATIP, Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. And guess what? It was a reactionary program to military encounters and sightings, and that is one tiny program. And I happen to personally know that there are more. Why do and you think gonna... they let you release that in the first place? Why do you think no, they even let you in the door? N nobody let me release anything. I've got a charming personality, Tyler. <laughs> you, that you do, sir. <laughs> yeah, I, I called up these individual witnesses, these admirals, these uh, you know fighter pilots, and I made friends with them, and I didn't burn them, and I didn't distort their story or mess it up when I told it. Mm -hmm. And guess what? The whole world is now. Commander Fravor's story is being twisted. And and I told it right. And he, we talked the other day. And he's like, everybody else is twisting it. I'm like, I told you it would happen. And I was like, yeah, I'll try to clear it up. But that's the deal, man. I just don't burn people. It ain't worth it. And the people I talk with is because I want to. And they're good people. I, I have a no D-bag policy. So. Right. Well, from this new film, which I actually had a chance to watch last night, uh, I wanted it to be fresh. And I just kind of... I wanted to wait to, as long as I could and, and stick with the audience because they're having to wait for it. But it was an amazing film, and it truly gives us an insight uh, after all of these years to what Bob's life, what he went through, how his life has changed. And, you know, I'd like to ask you, Jeremy, well, you've said before that timing is everything with your films. Uh, you know, why have you chosen as a filmmaker to focus your attention on this story now and is there any new info that the global audience will be learning upon the release of this new film? Yeah, there's new info. The whole film. This is not a rehashing of the past. This is not repurposing vintage footage. Thank you for saying this that. Is, yeah, this is brand new, breaking news and information. In fact, I am shocked because I did not anticipate what we were going to experience in the filming of, of this movie. So... Yeah, you can anticipate to have your socks knocked off for the film. You know, absolutely. You'll hear the chatter as soon as it's out in public. People are going to talk about it. So um, why now, though, is kind of an interesting question. I just want to briefly answer that. I mean, first of all, it's because, I don't know, Bob let me finally film him. So that was <laughs> cool. And then second of all, because I have always thought this is the most valuable story in modern history about UFOs and exotic propulsion and i stand I by agree. that i agree and and because we live in a different world now than we did in 1989 we now live in a world where people are on twitter and social media and all sorts of uh you know every communication device possible yet th they have a lack of credible information this is credible information and the world has changed we now know that it was a lie that the study of UFOs ended in 1969 with Project Blue Book, that our government lied to us, and that in fact, we are currently studying the UFO problem on multiple levels, and that is a game changer. All of a sudden, the story that Bob Lazar told in 1989 about a government program to study UFOs, to back engineer them, has a completely different meaning and light because of modern day events. It is time, it is time, and as I like to say, Bob's critics have been holding the mic for 30 years, and we're taking the mic back, and we're taking it back on December 3rd at the world premiere in Los Angeles, which you're going to be at, Tyler. So we're taking the mic back, and we're not giving up that mic for a while. We're going to scream into it. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be a blast. Well, I know you guys don't have a lot of time. I, I just have a few more questions, uh, starting with Bob. But let me ask you this. Um, what was the, if you could say, the most important thing that you learned from your time at S4? And follow up, if you could, would you go back and accept or would you not accept your position at Area 51 and S4 if you could do it over? Um, boy, as far as the most important thing, that's that's a difficult thing to say. Um, I guess the one thing that really caught my attention was the fact that there were alien craft. I mean, that's it. 
I thought there was a, this was advanced, uh, you know, what they hired me for was advanced technology and advanced propulsion system that the military had made. And it just happened to look like what people had called a flying saucer. The biggest shock in my life was the fact that the actual aim of the project was we have to figure out how this thing works. Right. Um, so it was it, it was really the scope of the whole project that there were actually alien craft from another civilization. So that today uh, remains and probably always will be in my life the most shocking thing I was ever presented with. Um, I already forgot the second Would part of Would you go back question. and accept uh, the job at uh, S4 if you could do it over? Yeah, I would always accept that job because just being exposed to that technology, uh, things I thought were impossible, I will never forget. Um, and usually people ask after that, would you, if you could go back, uh, tell the public again? And I really don't know how to honestly answer that question because sometimes I say I wouldn't, sometimes I say I would. It just depends on my mood right. of that day. Right. Um, uh, you know, and I, I really don't know, but I no, I would never turn down that project, especially knowing, uh, you know, that technology is real because that was the most fascinating thing in my life. Right. And I think that'll lead me to my final question for you, Bob. And it's a big question that my audience constantly asks, which is that in the end, why do you think, Bob, that there is so much secrecy? Why has the public at large, uh, been lied to why is this secret being kept about the ufo subject and still is to this day because this is the most powerful technology on the planet and anybody that controls this technology controls the world look it's all a battle you know whether we know it or not between you know russia the united states north korea i mean it, it's you know, if you really take a step back, they're all acting like little children on a playground. But uh, really, this is extremely powerful technology, and this is a military project. And you don't want to give away even the slightest hint of what's going on. At one time, part, you know, the project right before I got involved with it, the Russians were involved. And they made a huge discovery at some point. Again, this was right before I came on. And they kicked everyone else out and kept it to themselves and there's kind of been you know a point of contention between the russians and the united states right. at that time well i don't know what that was but yeah this is it i think it all boils down to weapons and controlling the world and forcing your views on everybody else that's just the bottom line well do you think that you know is there something that needs to happen for our government to to finally tell us the truth or is it just out of our hands I don't know if I can answer that question. I don't think our government ever really, you know, comes clean unless they're pressured to for right. some reason. Right. And there's no reason for them to come clean about this. Um, quite frankly, I'm more concerned about the repercussions from the movie <laughs> coming, <laughs> coming back on me. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, I have it wouldn't surprise me if I suddenly got accused of some bizarre thing. And I'm just I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. Yeah, that's that's been you know I got to tell you that's a debate of mine. I in one sense I'm like yes the movie's gonna do really well now, and the other sense I'm thinking oh no you know is that gonna affect Bob? And I think you'll understand that when you watch the movie that there's real world consequences to this type of dialogue, and I experienced that for the first time in my life like uh, doing this film. So as a friend, I want to you know hope. And protect that nothing bad's going to happen to Bob from this. But you know, Bob has always been able to defend himself. He has never needed a defender. Uh, he just chooses not to engage, and I think smartly over the years uh, because there's so much signal uh, or so much noise in the signal. So I, I'm look. I'm going to look at this really positively. I'm going to say we we've had 30 years where Bob has been, you know, really beaten up by the ufo community unnecessarily and honestly we're, we're so far beyond it our scope of our audience is so much bigger now with this movie you know dozens of millions of people are going to see right. this if not more and, and it's a new day i don't think bob needs to worry no, about no repercussions from government or anything like that we are now out in the light permanently let me tell you something Absolutely. 
we have an army behind us now. I mean, my little channel alone, we're about to hit 2 million subscribers, but have had almost a billion views in the last couple of years. We have an army. We missed you. Bob, we truly did. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of posting videos using 20-year-old vintage footage of you. I, I'm so happy that you came on. You have nothing to worry about. There's an army out there who support you and back you. And gentlemen, it, it's been an honor, a true honor, to have both of you here. I want to thank you for coming on today. Um, you know, Bob, you truly are a legend. Uh, you have millions of people behind you, so just remember that. I know it's been tough for you uh, over these years, but sometimes great men have to pay a price for the things they do and for doing what's truly right, and that is giving the public the truth that they deserve. And you have gone above and beyond that, sir. So I want to thank you for that. To Jeremy, I want to say thank you, my friend, for coming back on Secure Team once again and for all of your hard work getting these films made and getting this film made and for being one of the very few left spearheading this movement and leading the march for true disclosure. You are both always welcome on Secure Team. Thank you both again. It, it truly is an exciting time. And Jeremy, I'd like to end this by asking you, you know, is there any information that you can give regarding the film, when it's coming out, when, when can we see it? Tell us what you got to say, buddy. I'm going to give you that, but I'm going to give the mic to Bob for a second. Okay. What were you well, I just I just wanted to thank you for the kind comments, and uh, I look forward to meeting you when you when you come down for the premiere. Well, thank you, sir. I truly look forward to meeting you too, and it was an honor to have you. And so, just uh, about the movie, yeah. Let's just get this out so everybody knows. I really, really want people to see this film. That's why I made it as an independent filmmaker. When you watch that movie, and you buy it on iTunes, you buy it on Vimeo. That directly affects my life. You know, thank you. And, and Bob is making nothing off, the, off this film. He would accept nothing. I want to clear that up right away. It's only me. So if you want to see more movies from me, yes, please get the film. So you ask Tyler, I'm going to tell you, okay? So We do. We Bob want to Lazar, see more. Yeah, okay. Bob Lazar, Area 51, and Flying Saucers. That's the title of the movie. If you get it on iTunes, you get over two hours of bonus material, the most amount of bonus material, and then next up is Vimeo. You get all that bonus material too, but it's available on Amazon and all pay-per-view platforms. Just literally click the button, buy the movie, watch it, and you determine for yourself reality. Otherwise, somebody else is going to determine it for you so that's it man i hope you enjoy the film i'm really proud of this one celebrate with me watch the film and engage in the debate all right so you heard it right there guys if you want to see this movie i'll put all the links down below this is a historical film it's not going to be another one like this and from what i've seen jeremy has knocked it out of the park it's it's such a treat and especially for Bob to come out after all these years, after all he's been through, and putting his life back out there for the public. So let's show both of them. They're going to stand behind them. We're going to support them, support this film. We're going to watch it. It's an epic film. Thank you both for being here. I'm going to do my best to continue supporting you guys, and I hope you will both come back on very soon. I, I thank you so much, Tyler. Thank you. you know, just to make it clear, Bob Lazar is not going on UFO circuits. He's not doing radio interviews. You were like literally the only one. We have rejected everybody, every publication, everything. He he made he allowed me to make the movie. That's it, guys. <laughs> well, you hey, know what? Up. I was just trying to leave a little bit of hope that he might at some point come back on. That's all it was. I know. Very private man. No, I, and I, it's I, been I feel, a treat feel, having yeah, him. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that. <laughs> Listen, honestly, to be candid here, I'm hoping that Bob has such a good time at this premiere that he'll come with me to a couple more theatricals because totally. I think it's powerful for people to see Bob and to actually hear him talk about it. So he's not he can't be dehumanized by people. They're like, oh, that's him. Right. So that's my hope. But bottom line, I just want to let everybody know. Stop calling me. Stop asking me. <laughs> it ain't happening. Bob's not doing that. You know he what? Made the movie. You're right. Done. You're right. Bob, you have. That's true. You've done enough. I'm I'm. I'm selfish. Of course, I'm going to want you back on. I'm going to want you both back on. I'm a selfish man, right. but you, you, Bob, especially, you have done enough. Live your life. Enjoy your life, my friend. You have done it all. Jeremy, you're on your way, Thanks. man. I appreciate it, buddy. You've done great work. Thank you both for being here. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tyler. Can't wait to see you at the premiere, man. Talk soon. You too, buddy. Have a good day. All right. All right. Bye. You too.